Hi everyone, welcome to this episode podcast. We're going to interview Andre, the founder of Opium. Andre has a very strong background in capital market or what you guys call traditional finance, TradFi. And yeah, hi Andre, welcome. Hello, thank you very much for the good introduction. You can call it traditional finance, you can call it old finance, you can call it centralized finance. So yes, it is. Yeah, it's good that you've shifted to the DeFi space because that's exactly the kind of talents we need in the DeFi space. So can you maybe give a quick introduction to what Opium is? Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, first of all, a couple of words about myself. Indeed, I was uh, in traditional finance, but even before I was in mathematics, uh, I did some uh, mathematical uh, research and had a great career, actually a fantastic career in mathematics back, back in Russia. Then I moved here to Netherlands, to Amsterdam. And uh, I was a bond trader and then uh, managing a fund and one uh, hedge fund as well. And I quit three years ago because it, it's so exciting. Uh, in Ethereum and blockchain, uh, it was no DeFi, but what we were trying to do uh, back then, we were trying to make first derivatives uh, for the financial system. We didn't think about DeFi, it was no DeFi, but was, okay. Uh, exotic derivatives can be uh, very expensive. Uh, you need to trust someone, it's very untransparent. All these problems existed already for, for, for a very long time. And that was intention uh, to create something better. And then uh, we refactor it, we rebuild it, we uh, learn a lot, we optimize the gas, uh, architecture, so on and so on. And then it was DeFi as well. And uh, we start uh, to be in DeFi, uh, making partnerships, compos com uh, we are composable and so on and so on. Uh, that, that, that's a very uh, short story, but what is coming answering your question? What is opium? What is opium? Uh, it's uh, it's important to understand the history, but uh, the opium is the protocol uh, for synthetic derivatives or derivatives on a blockchain, or you can say analogs of centralized derivatives on a blockchain. It's all true, and uh, it's very simple how it works. You need to pick up an oracle first. Uh, once you, uh, because you want to make a derivative for something, right? Uh, you can pick up any oracle from the blockchain. It can be uh, Uniswap, Chainlink, just some feed from the contract. Any anything exists on a blockchain, you can consider as an underlying asset, and that's going to be uh, your, your your underlying asset or your oracle, your underlying asset. So step number two, you need to pick up the logic of the instrument because you have options, futures, CDS, CDOs. God knows what. Uh, it's a lot of uh, different derivatives. Of course, most popular we know it's futures options and uh, pretty cool. But uh, if you look at exotic, you can build anything. And this is actually really handy, really needed by a lot of real world economic activity. Um, so second number two, you pick up an instrument in, in Opium and uh, there is a library already, but you can also write yourself. Literally, with li five lines of code, you can define what is your instrument, what is the logic of agreement. And then step number three, you just uh, pick up maturity date and some parameters and press deploy button. And then you have a derivative, which is like uh, a coin uh, with long and short coins. Uh, it has an order book directly, so you can trade uh, them in the zero X order book. So it's super fast. It's a zero X protocol. Uh, it's, it's real real speed of the order book. And you have settlements on the blockchain. Uh, you can have secondary markets. You can have um, maturity payouts, so on, so on. Uh, in, for, for any derivative, the same way. And this is like ecosystem to create a uh, derivative that you need. And you have everything else ready for you. So that's, that's Opium. So going back to the part where you talk about how a lot of derivatives are very exotic in nature. And that's one of these common problems why derivatives did take off so much because they are so unique on its own. Like my options contract, my call option would be very different from your call option, even though we're talking about the same underlying. So in that exactly. case, how does, how do, what is the trade or secondary market like for these kind of derivative products? Uh, secondary markets technically is very easy. It's just a just market. Yeah. But the uh, advantage of the DeFi, uh, of the blockchain, that it's fully auditable, it's fully mm -hmm. transparent. So, uh, yeah, we can uh, speak about uh, different things. And, uh, and uh, it's very, in, actually, in traditional finance, it's very difficult to understand what kind of options I was speaking about because mm -hmm. normally there is 200, uh, like this book, uh, 200 pages uh, of all kind of legal descriptions and mm -hmm. notes. And then, of course, one jurisdiction can be this, another can be that. 
So it's, it's a disaster. Uh, in case of uh, blockchain, it's very transparent. So uh, we can go and just check the code and then okay. it's, uh, the, the code is the law basically. Correct. So uh, in this sense, it's, it's much easier to narrow mm -hmm. uh, to uh, something standard, but at the same time, it's very open. And uh, yeah. if you don't trust CDO, for example, now we have CDO, first CDO and DeFi. If you don't trust them because they caused the crisis of 2008 mm -hmm. in America, uh, you can go and check. In 2008, no, you, you can you cannot go and check, so you can only guess that something going wrong. But no, this is fully auditable. I think this is the biggest value. So uh, completely of, of agree. DeFi. I think yeah, in DeFi, it's all about transparency. It's all about looking, understanding, quantifying the risk involved. You don't have to read all the little legal things. In, you can just look at a smart contract. Everything's auditable. The thing is, each each put contract or each call option is very different. So how do you get enough liquidity to have this? secondary market to be trading these kind of very exotic products yeah so uh we have we use several tricks so and uh in, in general in DeFi, there is not so much liquidity so and to be honest uh if you look at any protocol uh it's not enough liquidity uh if you compare it to what it should be definitely not enough so mm -hmm. there, there, there is some some protocols has more less okay you can you can look at it but uh derivatives are the biggest market in the world it's uh, 20 or 30 times bigger than the whole global economy. So it's like really huge. And liquidity there is enormous. It's, it's the most liquid market in the world. If you look at DeFi, it's yeah, a little bit more, a little bit less, but still nothing So by, by this measure. Uh, to attract liquidity, uh, we use several tricks. Uh, of course, uh, now it's very trendy, very popular to uh, run liquidity mining. I think, and, and then you attract liquidity. But uh, this liquidity is very uh it, it how to say it in english but it, it, it will uh disappear uh mm. together with liquidity mining so it's, it's not it's very, very stable short in, yeah short-term incentives yes and uh, uh, if you use it right i think it's, it's cool because mm -hmm. then you kind of starting the car you need to start the car so mm -hmm. you just put uh you put extra effort to start the car but then if the car can work by itself mm -hmm. that, that that's I, I think ideal uh, usage of liquidity mining so yeah but if you constantly need to do this uh, and mm -hmm. otherwise the car is not working then something is probably wrong with your liquidity mining campaign so that, that's the first one the first trick uh then uh my favorite one is mirroring liquidity from centralized world and mm -hmm. i think this is a uh, future of many projects uh, in DeFi. So what, what, what we do, uh, we did it as experiment and we now want to uh, put it in production. We, because we have the same architecture like uh, traditional finance mm -hmm. uh, instruments, we can easily mimic or mirror or copy, let's say, mm -hmm. liquidity from centralized to decentralized. So you need one agent, one, uh, let's say, humming bot, so we did mm -hmm. humming bot, who constantly uh, mirror liquidity from centralized to decentralized. And then you can trade on decentralized and this bot gonna hedge for you. So it's just gonna transfer it. When, when you pick up the order from decentralized, so the bot makes sure that he take opposite position on, on centralized, uh, earning some fee on, it, on for this, but uh, th th then there is liquidity. The, the trick is that it shouldn't be one counterparty who is transferring liquidity from mm -hmm. uh, centralized to decentralized, but it should be many. If, if you have thousand such bots or 10,000 per million, then it's really immutable as immutable as a blockchain and i think this uh, should happen because uh centralized decentralized world uh, of derivatives is basically the same as uni united mm -hmm. uh and we, we need derivatives to serve real world's problem uh and uh we don't need them just to be to have derivatives and th that's why it's gonna i think it's gonna be uh bridges between centralized and decentralized uh world uh for now it's we, we see more uh need uh of derivatives just for decentralized within decentralized space and it's cool I, I really like it because uh when you need derivatives in the system it means system is mature already mm -hmm. enough and it's going to be more mature but uh, looking forward i think it's also going to be a uh, connection to uh to the centralized and uh then it's going to be enormous liquidity can you share an example of the bot where you're mirroring centralized and decentralized world so for example something that you guys have is the cds so a credit default swap of, let's say, I bet that ETH is going up 15%, someone else bets that they're going down 15%. And there isn't someone else on the other side taking my, doing the counterparty risk. So is that where the bot comes in and taps into the centralized market? 
uh, it can be done with CDS. So uh, if you want an exa real example, then mm -hmm. we did it with options. We took a mm -hmm. uh, couple of platform platforms like Deribit. Yep. Uh, let's take Deribit for this example. So we did a clone of their uh, options. So we, we create the same option, the same definitions in a decentralized world. Mm -hmm. And then you have centralized instrument, which is trading a lot. And mm -hmm. decentralized instrument, 100% the same definition. Uh, on 99.99 percent, the same definition. You mean by uh, the, the structure of these options contract? Yeah, this yeah. So the same, the same, the same maturity, the same oracle, the same condition. So everything the same. So you created in decentralized, but it's not active yet because here is a lot of trading in the centralized. Uh, on this side, there is nothing. You just created, and then you put this humming bot in between, and humming bot, bot uh, look, look for the orders uh, in mm. centralized, and make uh, mirror these orders into the decentralized order book. Mm -hmm. on the rig so uh, it can be re really fast they, they can go identically and mm -hmm. then you go and you want to buy instruments on a decentralized exchange so you pick up one of the orders from the order book mm -hmm. and you want to settle it at this moment the bot will take opposite position on their bit uh and then bot doesn't have any risk it just uh buy something here and sell something there mm -hmm. well the the interest of the bot of course going to be included so it will charge like two percent one percent 10% depend on them, like whatever market conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, but you have pure position, uh, which is decentralized, mm -hmm. and you, you, you don't touch centralized. So the bot does the, the work for you. Mm -hmm. And then if you have 10,000 bots, uh, then it's really mutable system. So then there's mm -hmm. no central counterparty. Then we basically connecting decentralized and centralized world together. This is really cool. This is like we, we've done it. it, it's working, and we want to bring it. But I think. Uh, maybe it's not this month that it's going to be super popular, but we're moving there. We see that we're moving towards uh, connection to world, centralized and decentralized. If you look at the regulator, if you look what banks are doing, if, if you look uh, how it goes, we're uh, moving towards each other and it should be a united system. So these bots are kind of like aggregators of centralized world and feeding into the decentralized world, almost like oracles, but take, actually takes a position in the centralized yeah. world. Yeah. And these yeah. profits goes back to the opium protocol as a whole. Uh, the bots uh, is just a mi like miners. Think about them like mm -hmm. miners. So you need the miners in order to for, for, the, for the blockchain to exist. Mm -hmm. And these bots are uh, infrastructure, basically points uh, which support this 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 system. Mm -hmm. It's not only one system in opium. It's 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 a, you ask very particular like about liquidity and uh, this is my favorite example. Uh, so the opium uh, uh, exists already in DeFi and. Uh, everything happening in DeFi, but this is one of the my favorite topics uh, for the future, for the next month. I think mm. it, it can be very hot. Yeah, absolutely. Especially as more institutions are coming in, they want to tap into a lot of opportunities in the DeFi space, but also quite afraid. So they're more comfortable with the CeFi world and the bridge can help to really mitigate that, that exactly. challenge and difference. Another, another, another favorite topic, uh, if you allow me, yeah. uh, because I think this is, this is really interesting, uh, is uh, CDS contract. So we have mm -hmm. tradable CDS, and if I'm not mistaken, we're only one who uh, now uh, have tradable CDS uh, in DeFi. And this is also very interesting for institutionals, uh, institutional players. Uh, it's very interesting for uh, their risking of the, of, of the whole system. And it's really interesting for the capital efficiency. So and let me just t touch uh, uh, all three points. So for the institutionals, why it's interesting for the institutionals, because I got quite a lot of calls from big players, and they say we want to put uh, real money uh, in a, in a, like a significant money in the DeFi. So let's speak hundred million dollars. So uh, and for them, uh, five percent is enough. They don't need ten percent. They don't need twenty. So five or seven is enough. So in case the protocol gives or some team gives 15 or 10, they can sacrifice half already. Mm. But what, what is crucial for them, they cannot afford to lose this 100 million. So mm. they need the protection of the capital and they don't need extra returns. And this is uh, really interesting. It's, it's different type of players. So what they need, they need CDS. They need protection of the capital and they willing to pay half of their potential return for this CDS. So that, that is, this is first thing. Uh, second thing is capital efficiency. Uh, CDS solve it because uh, you have a lot of capital which is not utilized. Actually, if you look like Uniswap, mm -hmm. uh, it's a lot of money there in LP. Uh, they earn commissions. Uh, they enjoy impairment loss, which not everybody understand uh, yet. 
but that's it. So basically you put all your capital and you have one small thing on top of it. It's, it's speaking traditionally, it's not capital efficient at all. So mm -hmm. ideally you want to have your capital, you want to uh, earn more on your capital because of several risks and those several risks are not correlated. So you don't put all the eggs in one, uh, how you can say, in basket. one basket. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and, and you like to uh, enjoy a higher return and more diversified risk. And that's the, mm -hmm. the definition of capital efficiency. So now it's not capital efficient. And this CDS allows to uh, for capital to be uh, more efficient because uh, what we now are working, you can put different type of tokens as a collateral for the CDS. So if I have A tokens from our uh, Y tokens, uh, LP tokens of Uniswap, I like to stake them uh, into the contract versus uh, CDS risk. And then I enjoy not only my other return, my Y uh, earn return, uh, my, my LP return, Uniswap, but also on top of it, extra return. Of course, extra risk, but extra return. And and those risks are not correlated. And this is pre pretty cool because uh, Y A token uh, risk is not correlated with CDS risk. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the second point. So my, more capital efficiency. And what was the third point I already uh, forgot uh, about C what is cool about CDS? Uh, so I already forgot the first one. <laughs> the, no, first one is on, it, it, the first one is kind of like fixed interest rate swaps, right? Sorry? The first one is kind of like fixed interest rate swaps. Uh, it's, it's kind of, first one is kind of capital protection. The second one mm -hmm. was uh, capital efficiency. Mm -hmm. And the third one uh, was... Uh, It's, 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 uh, I didn't sleep enough, so <laughs> I apologize, apologize for this. No, uh, it's de-risking, de yeah, de-risking, de 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 uh, mm -hmm. I mentioned. So DeFi now is very uh, risky, so not everybody mm -hmm. understands all of risks and uh, what, what's going on. People add more and more and more risks yep. in order to get uh, more return. And that's mm -hmm. super dangerous. That's what's happening in, that, that's actually happened in 2008, mm -hmm. where people start to, okay, Put more risk, more risk, more risk. But how can we uh, hide this risk? Let's invent risk tranching. We actually put so much risk. Now we're going to tranche it, but because of it was everything was correlated, and the mortgage market in the US was already uh, with serious problems. They invented this, but it didn't help. So what's what's going on in DeFi now? It's a little bit the same direction. So uh, adding extra risks, and we really need uh, two things in this year. I believe we need to de-risk. And we need uh, smart contract protection. And uh, by the way, CDS also solved it. So, okay, there are a lot of things to dive into in this three yeah. thing, three points that you've brought about. So the first one on risking, I think we can we can definitely talk about risk management and how de-risking look like. The second thing we can also talk about is the second point of capital efficiency. It really goes against the third point of de-risking because increasing capital efficiency actually means increasing the risk. So how would that work out? And the third thing that we can also talk about is one thing that DeFi, DeFi is super afraid of the risk on top of risks. So there's over collateralization, which is good, but it goes, back, it goes against the second point of capital efficiency. So how do we mitigate all together? Because they seem to be opposing each other. Uh, what exactly are opposing each other? Uh, so capital efficiency sure. versus de-risking. Yeah. Yeah, uh, well, it's abs absolutely uh, not opposing, in my opinion, mm. because capital e efficiency, what, 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 what is the definition of capital efficiency? Uh, in a very simple way, I would explain it like, uh, I have one risk, uh, which give me, uh, I don't know, 5%, and I have another risk, which give me, uh, I don't know, 6%. So by com uh, combining those two risks, Mm -hmm. I not only receive double reward, but my total risk decrease exponentially. So uh, that, that's the diversification. It? So if oh, I have market risk in my uh, diversification, that, that, okay. that's called diversification. So if I have market risk in my portfolio, so if mm -hmm. I just uh, accept uh, something, one, mm -hmm. and I have 10%, it's much worse than I accept 5% two times. Mm -hmm. And th because those two times are negatively correlated normally. Uh, if you can prove and that. Then yeah, exactly, exactly. That, that's, a, that's a very good point. It's not hard to prove. Uh, well, some things you don't need to prove because some things like 
uh, how what is the connection between uh, custodial risk of WBTC, so BitGo? Mm -hmm. What is the correlation between uh, re credit risk of them that, that they really like uh, mm -hmm. good custodian and risk of A tokens? So obviously, there is no connection, mm -hmm. right? Very, very, very hard to find. So, and of course, if you want to put uh, A DAI and A USDC. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Technically, it's different risks, but I think there is a big correlation because there is if we don't have if we have problem with other, then it's going to be big correlation, hundred percent correlation. Mm -hmm. So I, I I mean I mean uh, you don't need to prove it. You can start with very simple things. It's not mm -hmm. there yet at all. So you don't need to go to nitty gritty and prove some uh, very very specific risk. Start with very simple things. Mm -hmm. Combine uh, Tether risk or WBTC risk uh, with other risk. And this mm -hmm. is already like a uh, big, big benefit. Mm. So I, I don't think it's, it's opposing. I think capital efficiency, uh, it's really cool because you can choose your risks. And capital mm -hmm. efficiency definition is also different for, for everyone. Mm. Very, very simple idea, diversification. But uh, second idea that uh, my optimal portfolio, my optimal diversification is different than your optimal diversification. Because, mm -hmm. because you also have your views and your exposure. So, and you should tweak it according to your portfolio and I should tweak mm -hmm. it according to my portfolio. And that's all possible thanks to derivatives and mm -hmm. without derivatives, it's just all or nothing. Either I accept everything or I don't, don't do anything in DeFi. You mentioned that CDS can be used to hedge against risks of smart contract risks. So do you mean CDS used as an insurance against technical hacks of smart contracts? Yeah, exactly. Uh, as, as I mentioned, so the, how protocol looks like: first, oracle; second, instrument; and third, just parameters deployed mm -hmm. with parameters. Uh, if you uh, if you use oracle, uh, the, the price oracle, then uh, your CDS is going to be just for the price. Like mm -hmm. uh, if you if you use oracle, uh, which tells you if smart contracts were, were hacked or not, then it's going to be CDS for hack. Basically, mm. and and uh, you can call it insurance, and we do call it insurance basically because people understand insurance very easily, mm. and uh, not so many people uh, understand what is CDS, and they don't need to. So this is very very mm. technical. Uh, yeah, basically it's becoming an insurance. The oracle gonna tell you uh, was it a hack or not, and uh, the rest is just normal uh, insurance or CDS. So one uh, party write it, uh, so sell it. Another party buys it and pay, pays premium to be insured. And in case of default, one party is covering another party. Where do you get liquidity in this case then? Because there is no C5 market to tap into with the bot. Uh, yeah, so liquidity should come natural here. So we look mm. at the projects and, 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 and the points where liquidity uh, is naturally needed. So we, we don't even uh, probably going to announce liquidity mining for it because mm -hmm. Those again, those institutional players, they mm. really now uh, would like to be in DeFi. Uh, there is a lot of tier two projects which uh, look very good. So I think they, most of them, they uh, what we look at, uh, they, they have potential to be tier one, really good, really cool projects. And mm -hmm. institutions uh, stand ready to uh, invest money there, mm -hmm. but uh, they cannot uh, study. 20 different smart contracts uh, and they constantly upgrading and then you need to do two, two three audits for everyone and uh, it's a disaster for them. Mm -hmm. uh, very easy solution for them to buy this insurance because when mm -hmm. they buy insurance, they uh, don't care uh, about audit. Uh, it's going to be uh, on, on the project side. So they do an audit and, and so on. And people who write insurance, they can professionally look and, and say, okay, this is a good contract. I will write insurance for this. Mm -hmm. So th th this is taking headache from uh, institutional money mm -hmm. uh, more to the like professional players. And uh, they only need to audit one contract, like opium contract for CDS. And they say, okay, we trust this contract. So they trust CDS. So they trust insurance. And they can just buy insurance and invest into these projects uh, and it will help projects, it will help everyone basically. It's like, I made a, uh, another panel, I said, it's like uh, your car, you have a cool car, mm -hmm. uh, you want to put alarm that people, that it's, it's not stolen. Uh, you can put one alarm, two alarm, three alarms, very expensive, it's like an audit. Uh, alarm is like making another audit. 
uh, and then there is no guarantee that uh, it's not going to be stolen. It still can be stolen. Mm -hmm. But if you just go and buy insurance, you don't care about this anymore. So uh, insurance company will make sure that it is alarmed there, mm -hmm. uh, and you can sleep uh, well. And if the car is stolen, I hope not, but then you get insurance. This is the, 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 basically the logic. How do you incentivize underwriters, or how do you incentivize the insurance sellers or these derivative sellers? Because these are complicated products, and a lot of retail users are not really that sophisticated derivatives traders. So how do you incentivize that part of the liquidity? Yeah, that's, that's a very good, that's an excellent question because uh, it's not only for us, this for the whole market. So uh, for the whole insurance, uh, several projects uh, doing insurance in DeFi, trying to do insurance in DeFi. Uh, we see a lot uh, announced liquidity mining, but mm -hmm. this is, okay, this is very, we need to be very careful. Users need to understand. Uh, what they do for the liquidity mining, uh, they, incentive, they have extra incentive to write this insurance. Uh, but I think the real answer uh, that works for now, that works for, for the whole DeFi, it's what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the longer term and more sustainable solution is capital efficiency. Because uh, if I need to choose, I have, let's say, I, I have DAI or USDC, mm -hmm. then I can choose 5% on AVE or 6% writing insurance so mm -hmm. i like to take both but i need to choose when we have this mechanism where you can uh, use a tokens as a collateral for insurance or lp tokens as a collateral for insurance then i don't need to choose i basically uh have a question do i want additional six percent on my capital with additional mm -hmm. risk i'm not choosing between risk return i'm just saying okay i can pick up i can okay this i like i accepted this i like this i don't like this i like and then i have uh some of all the returns Mm -hmm. uh, and I enjoy all the risks, which are going to diversify each other. So my risk return profile is going to be better. So that's that's a real professional uh, solution, and uh, that will come maybe directly mm -hmm. by the users. Maybe somebody will aggregate the users and and make these pools. But this is how financial system basically works. So mm -hmm. why? And it's not it's nothing wrong. We have a lot of wrong things in financial system, but this, this is nothing wrong. This is diversification. Yeah. And I think we're still a bit early in diversification, especially when you want to aggregate all information. You want to aggregate a lot of on-chain data and you go from protocol A to protocol B to protocol C to execute all along the way. Oh my gosh, the gas fees are going to be so expensive. So with evolution of ETH2 coming out and that could probably help a lot with liquidity. Uh, we, 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 yes, uh, we also work together with Yuma, U, U, UMA yeah. protocol. Uh, we have some, some joint project, uh, and they, uh, design oracles, which are optimistic. Basically it's like real world case. So, uh, we, we have agreements. We need to supply, uh, the outcome of the Oracle yes. and, uh, we know if we're going to lie. So if you, if you're going to lie or I'm going to lie, we can raise a dispute for like going to the court. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we know that court for sure are going to be executed. It's going to cost, it's going to cost us money, but, uh, it's going to be true. Uh, in the court. So why do I need to lie now? I, I can only lose extra money for the court. I know the court is behind. So, and these optimistic oracles are pretty cool. So I think this is a very elegant solution uh, and they work. So we, we look at Uma, they work. So it was only one or two disputes uh, and the rest of execution is, is done. So people don't have incentive to lie. This is, this, is, this is one of the things which is pretty cool. So I think it's, it's going to be a combination. So mm -hmm. faster blockchain, uh, more uh, smarter incentives, the game theory, and most of the oracles you don't even need to call every second. You call them at maturity uh, uh, when the real cash flows are distributing. You don't need to call them every every second. That's also pretty natural traditional finance. I think it's very good that you talk a lot about risk, uh, diversification, risk management. One of the cool things, love to get your opinion, is with DeFi, it's a lot about risk management. It's about codifying risk into different trenches, into different kinds of assets and products. But when we look at options, we are still talking about very simple models like the Black-Scholes model. So what are the new innovative ways that we can look at in DeFi to start changing the risk profile when pricing option contracts? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, and I, I'm afraid I don't have a very good answer for it. So we can only uh, yeah, think how it goes. I don't think uh, there is uh, a problem with black shows because this is fundamental mathematical thing. So you make a binary tree and then you calculate. Pro not, 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 probability is still probability. Mm. So uh, but Black Scholes is still Black Scholes. 
a long tail, like a small long tail, and everything has a normal curve. But the reality of crypto exactly. is that it's completely very skewed and insanely skewed. So the, the model that, I mean, the model works for a lot more mature markets, but when we talk about derivatives, as we mentioned earlier, it's still very new. How do we price this volatility? How do we price this uncertainty into derivative products? Because that will be very good risk management. So our approach uh, is to 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 let to let it do uh, to the market to, to let do the pricing uh, to the market and then it's a natural incentive. So people who uh, are willing to research it and and, and provide a pricing, they can earn uh, extra because the market is not efficient. So they, they they know what's going on, so they earn extra. Uh, different approaches do IMM pool and uh, let people uh, just trade from it. It's basically the same. It's only ensure, uh, and we now also switch to it uh, because it also ensures liquidity. So uh, it's not like theoretical, I put, okay, I make analysis, I put my quote an order book and I, I wait for a counterparty. Mm. But I see, okay, there is free money on the table. I think mm. it's uh, calculated, I, I calculate the skew, everything. I don't believe in normal distribution here. I really have my view and I have free money. If, if I'm right, I can make money, it's there. It's one transaction and I'm, I take it. And I think this is uh, for now, for next uh, year, for sure, mm-hmm. it, it's going to be very hot. But you are absolutely right. When the market is going to be more mature, uh, liquidity is going to be much deeper and the probability is going to be more, uh, look like like, like normal mm-hmm. distributions and, and so on. Then, of course, Black Scholes will just do, do the job. This is very, very handy instrument. So what kind of, how are so you for- pricing your options right now? Uh, we give it to people, so we don't we don't price them. We just say, okay, this. this they just the decide, like I'm this, going to sell. This is, yeah, yeah, yeah. They they they, they just decide, and when they meet, they uh, have a contract. Yeah, and now we have a pool. We have a pool. Uh, that that's what we do already for two years. We just make an order book. People decide, and then they match with each other. Uh, it's it's super cool uh, technically because when the market is going to be mature, it, we we already have the system that's going to be like this. Mm-hmm. For now. It's not not enough maturity, let's say, in volumes and so on. That's why we made peer peer to pool logic. So we make a pool of uh, investments, and people uh, peers can go and uh, grab uh, the order if they think the price is attractive. And the price we make just uh, on the bonding curve from very cheap to very expensive. So it's again demand and supply. When I go first, I see oh this is really cheap insurance, so this is really cheap option. So I want to have it. And then uh, by doing so, the price is going up and I reach some point when nobody wants to pick it up. And uh, so it's very simple. So, But I think uh, we're trying to do more complex. We have order books. We're mm-hmm. trying to do market making, Blake and Scholes. Very, 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 very early, I think, for DeFi. Mm. We yeah. have it ready. So once once we think uh, we, we launch it, uh, we're ready to launch it, we, we, we can do it within one day. But for now, I think peer peer to pool. That's how DeFi works, and mm-hmm. people also need more education about options. Maybe they don't even want to trade options. I don't know. Uh, mm-hmm. I think people. We, we now uh, we we have put option which we call insurance. We call it price price insurance, mm-hmm. and people like to trade price insurance. So I buy Ethereum for one and a half thousand, and I buy uh, price insurance that it's, it's not going to go down. If it goes down, then I have payout for my insurance. This is very easy to explain. To my mother you yeah. know and if, if i start to speak put option then she goes crazy and say hey, what, what, what's the put option trading put option this is something but in fact it's the same it's insurance from the price going down yeah so. and i think that's that that really explains why options are more popular because people just look at it as put options equals insurance if the value of my asset drops i know i'm not affected by it i have to pay a little bit more for it but it's like paying for options people are more comfortable with that but as we go into more complicated products, CDO, CDS, all the other stuff, it takes a little bit more to get them across to that stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and we do uh, we did we did a CDS. I already spoke enough. Uh, we also did a CDO, so we did mm-hmm. risk crunching. I think it was uh, the first one. Uh, but Barn Barnbridge is uh, doing a good mm-hmm. job, so we we actually help each other. And actually, it's interesting. I just want to make some small uh, note about this. Uh, before I speak about risk crunching. Uh, with Barnbridge, uh, we have a very good relationship and we help them, they help us. And then we came 
to a very interesting topic. We said, hey, we're doing project uh, projects which are quite sophisticated already, risk tranching, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. uh, people not necessarily understand what kind of risk they run. Mm -hmm. And there is no regulation which oblige us to uh, report it in a certain mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. And with Tyler, we were sitting like saying, hey, don't we want to just uh, voluntarily come with some risk and disclosure standards and say, hey, this is what we designed. That's how we're going to uh, report our risks for our products. And we do it voluntarily with 20% of effort. We already achieve 80% of results. We just mm -hmm. simply speaking, okay, this is this risk, this is effect, and this is scenario. And we did it, and it was like super good uh, feedback from institutionals, from big players, from from everyone. I think self-regulation should be also part of DeFi. So mm -hmm. decentralized finance doesn't mean it should be Wild West. Mm -hmm. So we should at least uh, speak the same language, say, mm -hmm. comparing apples to apples. We, we, we compare, we, we speak in the same terms, but also self-reporting, it's super powerful because uh, that brings value for all the ecosystem, for all of us. So trying mm -hmm. to be for long term. But this is small note uh, on, on, on this, and I, I hope more projects join. So we're very open uh, to see uh, Ava is cooperating uh, on this and uh, some other guys. I hope to see more projects. Mm -hmm. But talking about risk tranching, yeah, we did, uh, it was an, another week, an article in Coindesk, we did a risk tranching for compound interest rate. And I think it's pretty cool, pretty uh, simple, but powerful way to do risk management. So uh, the idea is you, take uh, risks in the same pool and you don't want to make all the complicated formulas and calculations you just want to say okay uh, there are three tranches and i split it okay first tranche always get the money the first second tranche get money the second and if, if some money left that's going to go to third tranche mm -hmm. and then this is uh, low risk middle risk high risk mm -hmm. as long as again risks are not correlated like in 2007 this is super powerful and super simple to understand model. Mm -hmm. So we've talked a lot about very complicated products. What about for retail users who want to get simple products, but they also want to get exposure to opium? What would you recommend? How, how do you recommend them to get started? Uh, insurance. Go, go and see insurance. And we're going to uh, promote insurance uh, protection, insurance we call, call differently. Uh, so decentralized insurance, uh, it can be for price. It can be for custodial risk, like Tether. It can be for uh, smart contract risk. But this is super uh, easy to understand because mm -hmm. everybody understands insurance. At the same time, there is a put option, a CD, different CDS constants behind. You don't need to know about it. Uh, it is useful in terms of your tail risk and it's in terms of your education. And I think the pricing, what, what the market is pricing is, is also pretty attractive. We've seen quite, quite some uh, demand for it. And what about the exposure to the opium token? It's a governance token. Mm -hmm. So How that's, can people what get can I, started can I with say? that? Uh, I like people to vote more to get mm -hmm. with the proposals. And uh, that's a governance token. It should be driven by the community. Uh, the community can decide. I think it's also a very interesting stage because we got these tokens starting from Compound probably. We got many governance tokens. But uh, it's not uh, really, not, not everybody understands the power of it. Yeah. Because, and, and we've seen with Uniswap, people were dropping these tokens, uh, stupidly selling on the market. But it, it's, it's really like, it's a huge protocol with huge turnovers and mm -hmm. uh, you shouldn't just drop it. You can vote, you can own, you can uh, be part of it. And that's a great value. That's, I don't know, that, that's why uh, we do Opium. Not not because of uh, short term uh, things, but because we built something really cool for long, which you can be part of. And uh, people need to realize that governance tokens are actually governance tokens, and not a uh, thing for speculation or something like this. With the opium token, ten percent of protocol fees are also socialized or redistributed out to opium token holders. Is that correct? Not no, not yet, uh, because the protocol collects ten percent of the fees. Yeah. Uh, that that that's collected in the protocol. Mm -hmm. uh we don't distribute it to token holders no okay and uh, we simply we, we simply uh, cannot do this legally mm -hmm. uh because if i start to uh distribute it uh then, then it's more look like a security we don't want it mm -hmm. so and i think other projects also following the same i think other projects saying okay 
they collect they, they 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 may collect fee they may not yet collect fee mm -hmm. they may collect low higher fee they may vote whatever but uh i think most of the project they think the distribution uh can be done later mm -hmm. when the protocol is decentralized enough so it's not a single party saying okay i want to distribute it because then the, this party has a problem i mm -hmm. think in general case uh now to make distributed system to see how it works to upgrade to adjust and the fees, yeah, I don't know. They, they, somebody you could use can a buyback model. It. You can use the 10% the fees in a buyback model, which de indirectly redistribute out gains to existing holders. That's that's also possible. That's also, I mean, this is up to the voting. So, and uh, the, the, the cool thing of the governance tokens, uh, once proposal and vo voting is done, yep. it's going to be uh, executed automatically. So mm. there is no party who, who will take a decision. So if all the users come together and say, hey, we want uh, to change the protocol, we want to collect fees, we want to collect higher, or we don't want fees at all, or we want whatever they want, they vote, and then it's done. And mm -hmm. this is real power. Yeah, completely agree. Okay, so one last question. If you can give one advice to all these derivatives, DeFi derivatives designers, or creators, economists, or financial structurists, what advice would you give? Use opium to design. <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, I would... Uh, one advice I would say uh, try to find a balance between what is needed and what uh, like what what is needed uh, in order to have mature cool system and what currently uh, what what is currently needed. So mm -hmm. that's the biggest uh, lesson we learned because we did a lot of professional cool stuff and the market was not ready for it. And now we're doing uh, some simple stuff, very powerful though. And market takes it uh, with great feedback, and we understand that we also need to uh, understand what users need, what what is ecosystem ready for, and so on. So don't try to develop a castle in a in a cloud with perfect uh, Black Scholes models and so on, as you said. If, if market is not ready, do it step by step. It will come. So it's it's amazing uh, development of DeFi anyway. It will come. Well, thank you, Andre, for your time. Is there anything else you want to add? Thank you so much uh, for very uh, good content. I would also encourage uh, all the all the users to watch your videos because that that, that, that was a surprise. So you did some uh, good video about the opium, and uh, I looked at other videos, and I think you do a great job. So I would like to wish you a lot of success, and I also think that this content will be top in the in the DeFi. So it will it will be very important not to say, OK, this is a token. You can do this with it. But you, you have it very, very, very deeply. And I think this is very good for the long term. So wish you a lot of success. Thank you so much. Well, and thank you for your time. And uh, we'll speak soon. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye.